Uh, good morning. Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Uh, we are in the early days of a technological revolution that will transform the aviation industry and our national airspace. In recent years, we have witnessed the growing use of unmanned aerial aircraft or drones to improve many different sectors of our economy, including infrastructure, energy, emergency response, and agriculture. This committee has met a number of times to discuss the opportunities and challenges, including regulatory and safety issues that will come with drones. More recently, we have heard from developers of new flying car aircraft. Uh, these aircraft may soon fly commuters and across town travelers above congested highways, bridges, and roads in our cities. It was not long ago that flying cars only existed in science fiction. These aircraft will carry three or four people short distances, fly a couple of thousand feet up, and share similar flight technology to drones. It's an exciting time for the aviation industry in the United States. Other countries see this potential as well. For example, at the end of August, the Japanese government convened a meeting in Tokyo that included 21 private companies to develop a plan for introducing flying cars there in the next decade. This meeting included American and European companies in addition to Japanese firms. Companies participated range from tech companies and airlines to aerospace and automobile giants that we all know. And Japan is not the only country embracing this new transportation initiative. Firms in China are also looking to establish themselves as leaders. The United States must be active in order to maintain its global leadership in aviation. That means that the Federal Aviation Administration needs to stay ahead of these new technological advancements. One thing that remains unchanged in the face of these developments is that our number one priority has been, is, and will be safety. To both ensure safety and maintain our leadership in aviation, we must systematically address a number of issues. Today, we begin with how we safely and efficiently integrate new users into the national airspace system. Each day, thousands of conventional aircraft fly at altitudes that can often be measured in miles and fly between airports located in many of our communities. UAS and flying cars will fly at altitudes much closer to the ground and more often than not operate from places other than airports. These differences raise at least a couple of initial questions of how UAS and flying cars integrate into the airspace. First, how will these aircrafts physically fit and operate within the three-dimensional airspace and be kept at safe distances from other aircraft? buildings and people on the ground in urban and other environments. The second big question relates to air traffic control system. Air traffic control and conventional aircraft rely on a number of procedures, including extensive voice communications between pilots and controllers over the radio. Flying cars and UAS will be far different. The concept is that highly automated systems on these aircraft will communicate with other highly automated systems on the ground such as UAS uh, traffic management with less human intervention. So the question here is, how will the new aircraft and systems incorporate with existing ones and also with each other? While those are big questions around airspace integration, there are others. In recent months, we have seen growing interest in more use of counter UAS systems in the face of an emerging risk posed by unlawfully operated drones. There are many unknowns about the use of counter UAS systems which could impact avionics and air traffic control. Flying cars and lawfully operated UAS could also be impacted. Fortunately for us, there are bright and creative people applying their talents to realize the benefits of UAS and flying cars in both the, vi in both the private and public sectors. These include efforts being undertaken in my district by the FAA's premier flagship technical facility in Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey, to advance airspace integration. We appreciate all the work in the industry and the FAA are doing at the FAA Tech Center to make safe integration of new aviation technologies a reality. As this subcommittee continues to look ahead, it is important that industry engage with the members of this panel. Uh, there are exciting issues, and I look forward to hearing from our distinguished panel of witnesses. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Larson for any opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for calling today's hearing. 
This morning, we're discussing issues related to the integration of new and emerging users into the U.S. airspace. The chairman and I have ensured this precise topic be a focus of the subcommittee's uh, oversight work in recent years and with a particular emphasis on unmanned aircraft, which we're here to discuss today. And I'm pleased that we're all, uh, we'll, we'll also explore the next new thing that may soon take the skies, passenger drones. Two of the panelists today will describe how previ the previously unthinkable and only imagined in shows that I watched growing up, like the Jetsons, is pressing forward at a rapid pace and will soon change how the national airspace is used. According to a recent industry scorecard, U.S. drivers spend on average more than 40 hours each year in traffic during peak hours. Traffic congestion not only costs U.S. drivers more than $300 billion each year, but results in wasted hours and lost productivity. It takes a toll on air quality and the environment as well. This is something uh, with which my constituents are all too familiar. A 2017 industry study found commuters around the city of Everett and the district I represent spent more time stuck in traffic gridlocks than anyone else in the country. So yes, we're better than Washington, D.C., but barely. But with recent advances in design and technology happening in places like Washington State, more than 50 passenger drone concepts are reportedly in development and testing. Such concepts have the potential to reduce traffic congestion and the demand on roads and bridges nationwide by carrying commuters through the air at low altitudes. Some of the new concepts aim to fly in U.S. airspace by 2020, but before that occurs, several issues need to be explored. For instance, how and where will they operate? How will Congress ensure operations are safe for those in the aircraft and for people and property on the ground? Uh, we're already seeing the risks uh, unauthorized use of small UAS pose the aviation system. So in considering passenger drones, safety must be paramount. Another important question is how and when will the FAA develop a comprehensive regulatory framework to integrate these operations into U.S. airspace? Is the FAA on track to accommodate this fast-paced industry so the U.S. remains globally competitive? There may be lessons learned from the FAA's efforts to integrate drones. Initially, when the FAA was not keeping pace with the global stage, U.S. drone companies threatened to go abroad for testing, development, and deployment. What can be done here to prevent that from happening uh, with this new technology? Is there a role for Congress? And finally, how will the passenger drone concepts we explore today become accessible and realistic options for all once deployed in cities across the nation? So I look forward to exploring these topics today uh, with the panelists. And of course, I look forward to discussing continued integration issues associated with unmanned aircraft. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, uh, submit the rest of my comments uh, for the record and uh, look forward to the panelists. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, we are pleased to have Ranking Member Peter DeFazio with us. Peter, do you have any opening remarks? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I do uh, briefly. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you on holding this hearing, and perhaps it'll be the last hearing uh, over which you pre uh, preside on the subcommittee, and I want to thank you for your great work, and uh, I've enjoyed working with you, and I'm sure you won't be a stranger. So. Thanks. Thank you. Um, what's that? Well, you're not leaving, as far as I know, Sam, unless, unless we've come up with a candidate in your district. <laughs> <laughs> oh, presiding, yeah, okay, yeah, I could have said that, but I'm just not, I'm not measuring the drapes yet. So, um, anyway, this, uh, this is a really important hearing. I mean, uh, it's mind-boggling. Uh, to read about, uh, you know, uh, what Uber's uh, anticipating, what Joby is is uh, uh, far along in developing in, in terms of uh, new forms of transport, uh, which could uh, solve, uh, help solve congestion. You know, yesterday we held a hearing on technology, uh, and there are things which can mitigate uh, ground uh, congestion, uh, but they aren't ultimately going to resolve it, and as we continue uh, to grow in population and density, uh, we'll be back at this point 10 or 15 years from now, even if uh, the technology can mitigate the ground congestion. So new solutions are warranted, and there's certainly a lot of potential in what we'll hear today. Uh, the key thing uh, will be the uh, safe uh, integration into the existing uh, controlled and uncontrolled uh, airspace. Uh, you know, we are making progress on UTM and, and LANC, and, uh, you know, we will hear uh, from uh, Skyward uh, today uh, who uh, is working on, on those issues, which is absolutely critical. And kind of interesting that Oregon, which isn't, although Portland's getting to be kind of a mess, but uh, one of the most congested places in the country, uh, has pioneered in some of these technologies. The first demonstration I ever saw of, uh, of uh, 
ADSB was a company in Salem, uh, in Oregon, and now we have Skyward in Portland working on uh, this extraordinary uh, new integration for less traditional uh, operations uh, commercially. And uh, I can't uh, help but to again make a point that the key thing, and we'll hear from the FAA today here, is that we need to be able to regulate so-called model aircraft. Now, the model aircrafters uh, who are responsible and longstanding group of people, uh, you know, I started out with the little balsa wood planes with the little engines that wouldn't work, and I know, you know, what they're doing, but at some point they became petrified that the FAA, which wasn't considering regulating them, was going to regulate them in ways that were detrimental, and they got my Republican colleagues to put a very broadly worded uh, provision in an FAA bill which prohibits any regulation of model aircraft, which includes over one million drones that have been sold in the United States of America. What's the problem there? Well, uh, just uh, last week when I was home, uh, we had to ground all the aircraft fighting uh, the Terwilliger fire uh, about 25 miles from my house because some jerk flew his toy drone into the controlled and prohibited airspace. The sheriff said, we don't know who the person is or where it came from. We can't do anything about it. So even though we've upped the fines, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, I got a, a uh, provision in the FAA bill that came out of uh, the House that would allow reasonable regulation and operator identification of these drones. Uh, it's critical that we take that step. There is a competing amendment that won't get the job done uh, put in by the Chinese toy manufacturers. So I would hope that Congress in its wisdom decides that we're going to get down the path of sanity here and allow real regulation, real identification, uh, and uh, not have to wait until uh, we go back 20, 25 years ago when we used to call the FAA the uh, uh, they said they had a tombstone mentality. Uh, they investigated and fixed things after we lost a passenger aircraft. We don't want to go back to those days, but that's going to happen with one of these drones being illegally and improperly uh, operated, whether it's maliciously or, uh, you know, someone who's just a jerk. Uh, so um, anyway, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to raise that point again, since we are sort of having a conference with the Senate, which sort of almost kind of did an FAA bill, but now says they had 90 amendments that would have been adopted if they had taken it up, and so therefore we have to deal with all their 90 amendments that never were adopted and were never taken up on the floor of the Senate, so I'm not sure we get to resolution. Anyway, with that, uh, thanks for being here. Okay, uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I'd like to now welcome our distinguished uh, panel of witnesses. Uh, first on the list is Michelle Yak, who's director of the Federal Aviation Administration Technical Center. Um, I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege because of those of you who have attended any of these hearings or meetings uh, know that whenever I get the chance, uh, the, the FAA Technical Center that Shelley's the director of is the premier facility in the world for safety, security, research, and development. Uh, there's somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 incredible people who dedicate themselves each and every day to keeping America first. Uh, Shelley has done an excellent job, and uh, we welcome you, Shelley, today. Jay Merkel, Director, uh, Deputy Vice President of Program Management Organization for FAA Air Traffic Organization. Uh, Mr. Tom Prevo, Director of Engineering Aerospace Systems for Uber Elevate. Um, Joe Ben Bevert. Uh, founder and Chief Executive Officer of Jovi Aviation, and Mariah Scott, President of Skyward. Uh, thank you all for being here, and um, we've asked you to, your full statements will be submitted into the record. We ask you to do your best to keep uh, your opening statement to about five minutes, and we'll proceed. Shelley, you're up first. Thank you for your kind words. Um, Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chairman Schuster, Chairman Lobiondo, Ranking Member DeFazio, Ranking Member Larson, and the members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the FAA William J. Hughes Technical Center and the work that our 3,000 employees and contractors do to facilitate new entrants, new users, new technologies into the National Airspace System, or the NAS. My name is Shelley Yak. I am the director of the Technical Center and the FAA's director of research. Accompanying me today is Jay Merkel. 
He is the Deputy Vice President of the Program Management Organization within the Air Traffic Organization. His organization is responsible for implementing next generation air transfer transportation system programs and sustaining the NAS system. From 1958 to the present, many of the complex technologies and systems in the NAS were researched, developed, tested, and began their nationwide deployment at the Technical Center through its unique research, engineering, testing, evaluation, and deployment platforms. We are able to accomplish these tasks because we are responsible for managing and operating a one-of-a-kind federal laboratory. Our workforce is composed of world-class and world-renowned engineers, scientists, mathematicians, and technical experts. We do our work through partnerships with industry, academia, and other government agencies. The Technical Center has two primary missions, to support the advancement of the next generation air transportation system and to sustain the operation of our NAS. In other words, we keep the NAS operating and running while we're also building our future. The Technical Center is the place where we turn ideas into value and problems into solutions. The work we do at the Center ensures that the United States continues to lead the world in embracing, implementing, and integrating new technology such as unmanned aircraft systems into the NAS. Unmanned aircraft systems or the UAS, are at the forefront of change in the aviation industry. The need for us to fully integrate this technology into the NAS continues to be a national priority. In the past few years, we have witnessed the exponential growth of UAS technologies and market applications, and we know that the research must keep pace in supporting their full integration. FAA's research portfolio in total contains six research domain areas, which support and align with our UAS integration roadmap. For example, the FAA's airport infrastructure and technologies research traditionally includes pavement and terminal area research, now includes research on the potential uses of UAS in the airport environment. Our aircraft safety assurance research area focuses on aircraft systems and materials, propulsions and fuels, including fire safety, which also addresses lithium batteries. And our digital systems and technologies domain research researches communication links, electronic systems, and cybersecurity, all topics relevant to UAS and urban air mobility. Also applicable is our Digital, our environment and weather impact mitigation research on weather, icing, noise, and emissions, and our human er aeromedical factors research on operator training and digital interface requirements. The sixth domain, aviation performance and planning, brings it all together. This domain performs research on improvements in air traffic management and integrating new entrants into the NAS. In addition to the work in these areas, the UAS Integration Pilot Program has been busy accelerating drone technology. This past May, Secretary Chow selected 10 state, local, and tribal governments, each partnering with private sector entities to participate in the program. This month, awardees across four different states successfully flew drones, demonstrating the innovative ways drones may assist their communities. These areas include long-distance drone delivery, agriculture and infrastructure inspections, and even wildlife management. Throughout our history, FAA has adapted to changes in technology and has successfully integrated new operations and equipment into the NAS. Working together with you, Congress, and our stakeholders, we are confident we can balance safety and security with innovation. Finally, before I conclude, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the support of Chairman Schuster and Subcommittee Chairman Lo Biondo. You have both been instrumental in providing the FAA with the direction and necessary resources to maintain our position as a global leader in aviation. On behalf of the 3,000 employees at the center and all FAA employees, I thank you both for your leadership and wish you well as you retire from Congress. This concludes my statement. Jay and I will be happy to answer your questions at this time. Okay, thank you, Shelley. Uh, Jay, do you have an opening statement? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I do not. Shelley has our only statement for the FAA. Okay, uh, thank Dr. Prevost, you're up. Good morning.
Chairman Lobiondo, Ranking Member Larson, Ranking Member DeFazio, and members of the subcommittee. It is a privilege to, uh, to be here before you today to discuss Uber's perspective on airspace integration of new aircraft. Mm. My name is Tom Prevo, and I am excited to lead Uber's airspace systems engineering. Uber is developing aviation products because we believe aerial ride sharing and drone deliveries have the potential to radically improve urban life. As a multimodal transportation company, Uber believes solving the problems of congested urban environments is core to our mission of making transportation safe, reliable, and affordable. Just as skyscrapers allowed cities to use limited land more efficiently, urban air transportation will use three-dimensional airspace to alleviate transportation congestion on the ground. One of the primary challenges in enabling urban air transportation is airspace integration and air traffic management. In order to operate at affordable prices and serve customers well, we intend to fly thousands of aircraft in each metropolitan area that we serve. The traditional human-centered air traffic system, however, is not designed to manage air traffic at this scale. Therefore, we applaud NASA and the FAA for developing the novel concepts and technologies for unmanned aircraft systems traffic management, commonly abbreviated as UTM. We encourage NASA and the FAA to place the highest priority on extending these concepts towards other forms of urban air mobility, including small passenger carrying aircraft, such as electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. These concepts are paving the way for Uber and other companies to drive in innovation and develop airspace services that manage the vehicles on our network safely and efficiently without putting an undue burden on existing air traffic operations. Our vision is to operate aircraft along precise virtual route networks that can be dynamically adjusted to the needs of air traffic safety and control, noise and other community considerations, as well as air traffic demand. These networks will provide high predictability and transparency of our operations. Our systems will constantly monitor each flight with several safety layers handling outlying situations. In developing these systems, Uber will take a systematic approach to integration and validation in simulations and field testing to ensure interoperability and safety. Uber has signed two Space Act agreements with NASA, one for the development of UTM concepts and technologies, and another to explore urban air mobility, or UAM. Under the agreement focused on UTM, we are actively collaborating with NASA and a number of other companies to develop and test the information exchange protocols between the FAA systems and the industry-based UAS service supplier systems. Under our UAM agreement with NASA, we are focused on assessing the impact of new urban air entrants on traditional air traffic operations with the goal of developing procedures and technologies that allow urban air traffic to integrate and scale into the existing operations. To kickstart this area of collaboration, a simulation study will be conducted at NASA Ames Research Center in the Silicon Valley in just two weeks. Uber is participating in the U.S. integration pilot program administered by the Department of Transportation and the FAA. We are proud to be a part of the team led by the city of San Diego that was recently selected to conduct flight tests as part of the pilot program. We work with many partners in the industry on overcoming the technological barriers to conducting safe and acceptable drone deliveries and are pleased with the exceptional collaboration between industry and the FAA to work through the regulatory barriers associated with operating multiple unmanned vehicles safely over people and beyond the line of sight. Beyond the UAS IPP, Uber is excited about the work the FAA is conducting through its low altitude authorization and notification capability initiative, more commonly referred to as LANS. Uber believes LANS sets the groundwork for the future of drone traffic management and is supportive of its ongoing expansion. We encourage the FAA to extend the approach of coordinating airspace access through digital data exchange beyond the static facility maps. We commend the Department of Transportation on these innovative future-facing projects and look forward to working with the department on these and other exciting initiatives, including establishing federal rules on remote identification requirements for all drone aircraft. Uber is investing in urban air transportation because it has the potential to deliver time, time savings at affordable prices to consumers across the world. We see exceptional demand across all markets for safe, reliable, fast transportation services, 
and our network can be an excellent supplement to public and private transit options. The converging forces of improving battery technology, massive utilization, and the outset of reliable autonomous aviation will transform how people and things move around cities across the world. Working with leaders in both the public and private sector, we are confident Uber will make a sizable impact on this challenge and bring about a lasting positive change for the world. Thank you for your time, attention, and invitation. I look forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you, doctor, for your testimony. Mr. Benoit. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Lobiondo, Ranking Member Larson, Ranking Member DeFazio, and distinguished members of this committee. Thank you for your work in creating the safest and most efficient transportation system in the world. It is a great honor to be here today to tell you about the progress towards my childhood dream of a civilization unfettered and free to fly. Our small team of dedicated and driven visionaries has fused a series of technological advancements into an extraordinary and unprecedented aircraft. Safe and quiet, nimble and fast, accessible and affordable. We will operate a fleet of these electric aircraft as air taxis, flying from building to building. My mission is to provide a service so compelling and affordable that everyone will fly every day. I believe that unbounded aerial mobility will drive gains in productivity, quality of life, and bring about a renaissance as we turn streets into parks. We are rapidly growing our team of engineers and technicians and are venture backed by prominent investors. We plan to create thousands of high quality domestic jobs as we scale from certification into vehicle manufacturing and service operations. As a nation, we spend hundreds of billions of dollars each year building and maintaining our roads, and yet congestion is more acute than ever before. The limitations of the automobile and our ground infrastructure constrain where we can work and where we can live. On average, we spend nearly an hour a day in the car locked to one-dimensional trajectories. Aerial mobility will save us billions of hours per year and increase access to high-quality jobs. Managing airspace will be one of the key challenges in delivering this safe, efficient, and reliable means of air travel to our end customers. We will begin our operations with the ex within the existing airspace framework with a pilot on board who can coordinate and deconflict our flights using traditional radio-based system to maintain real-time communication with the FAA flight control staff. Our initial flights will be very much like helicopter operations today, following established, safe Part 135 regulations. However, as the size of our operations scale, we will need to move to an increasingly automated air traffic control system that allows for digital deconfliction of airspace in real time. We support the ongoing development of unmanned traffic management at NASA and the FAA. Given the incredible foresight and hard work over the past decade by my colleagues at the FAA and your committee, uh, the certification path for vehicles like ours has been dramatically improved. Thank you. We believe Part 23, Amendment 64, plus special conditions can provide a basis for our vehicle certification. We have been working closely with the FAA to establish our means of compliance. We encourage Congress to provide the FAA with the resources that they need to support their rapidly increasing workload as they usher in this new era of mobility. Alongside airspace management and vehicle certification, the development of landing sites within both urban, suburban, and rural in airspaces is necessary for the successful deployment of this service across our nation. The provisioning of these locations requires careful consideration of updated standards relating to landing zone requirements and pass site and passenger security. It is impor important that standards for these sites are more uniform rather than less so. To that end, I'm sorry. A, a patchwork of disparate regionalized regulation is not in the public interest. 
We have already begun working with select municipalities to help define standards and best practices for takeoff and landing sites and for operations. We encourage close coordination and cooperation between federal, state, and local governments and regulatory agencies to synthesize these best practices in formal standards that can provide clear nation nationwide path to compliance and authorization. If I could leave you with one takeaway from today's hearing, it would be that this technology is very real and it is here now. I want to thank the leadership of this committee and its members for your time today. We believe this new mode of transportation will bring about profound positive impact on our daily lives and on the productivity of our nation. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Scott, you're recognized. Chairman Loviando, Ranking Member Larson, Member DeFazio, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing on airspace integration. At Skyward, we provide software, aviation expertise, and consulting services to help companies use drones safely, efficiently, and legally. I've spent my career bringing new technology to market in highly regulated environments, not only in drones, but also in healthcare and secure online transactions. I understand the tremendous opportunity and responsibility that comes with the integration of UAS in the national airspace. In order to maximize the value that drones can provide, we need three things. One, continued public-private partnership as we work towards universal traffic management. Two, regulatory innovation from the FAA and adequate enforcement of laws. And three, freedom to compete for the best solutions in the market. There are already a number of effective public-private partnerships encouraging innovation and reducing barriers for business, including the UAS Integration Pilot Program and Lance. Last winter, our customer, PBS Engineering, received a contract with Portland Public Schools to perform roof inspections, for which drones are hands down the best tool. However, many Portland schools are in controlled airspace, so they were forced to delay and evaluate other methods. This spring, Lance went live in the Northwest, and PBS Engineering was able to quickly get the authorization they needed for drone use, saving public funds and minimizing safety risks for employees. Our customers love Lance because they can fly more jobs. We love Lance because it's the first step towards a universal traffic management system that will allow manned aircraft, drones, and eventually flying cars to safely share the airspace. Historically, UTM has stood for UAS traffic management, but universal traffic management includes every vehicle that operates in the airspace. This is a decentralized network, like a wireless network or the internet, for coordinating all types of aircraft efficiently, safely, and scalably. UTM will require public-private partnerships among aircraft manufacturers, sensor engineers, software developers, network providers, and regulators to implement standards and manage an interoperable worldwide ecosystem. Google's new InterUSS project, in which we are a founding member, is an open source, decentralized platform to put standards into action. The platform will enable any UAS service supplier, like Skyward, to share standardized, minimal sets of data that protect operator and customer privacy, but provide flight deconfliction and safe access. We have the technical know-how, but we have work to do on the regulatory front. For competition to flourish, current federal regulations must be enforced, and new regulations must support industry growth. This is an opportunity for leadership to enable commerce and safety. We're encouraged by the latest version of the FAA Reauthorization Act, especially fewer restrictions for R&D and transporting payloads beyond line of sight. We agree that enforcement authority should be given to the FAA, which has the expertise to regulate both commercial and recreational vehicles in the airspace. Moving forward, we'd like to see the FAA continue to collaborate with industry on standards, especially remote identification of all aircraft, which we believe will directly enhance safety and spur economic growth. Remote IDs are essential for both hobbyist and commercial aircraft and are a critical foundational element for a universal traffic management network. 
We continue R&D on networked fleet deployments and UTM. We believe that operating drones on Verizon's LTE network will be important to safely and securely deliver functionality like remote ID, airspace access, flying beyond line of sight, and remote air fleet deployments. Verizon is investing billions of dollars in 5G infrastructure, which will enable secure aviation grade routing. 5G's latency and reliability, combined with the high density of micro cell sites, make it a good candidate to support autonomous air taxis. And virtual network slicing in 5G protects pieces of the network for safety critical applications, such as search and rescue. The technical and regulatory project of integrating the airspace is enormous, yet small steps are already having a tremendous impact. Now we need to make bigger strides. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee, and thank you for the support you've shown to the aviation industry as a whole. Uh, thank you very much. We'll now start with questions from Mr. Larson. Rick, you're up. Uh, thanks. For um, uh, Ms. Yak, uh, do you have any updates on results that might be uh, informative or helpful to the FAA or the industry with regards to the drone integration pilot program? Uh, yes, uh, that is a program I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks. That's a, a program that we put in place that allows us to collaborate with state, local, tribal right. governments and um, purposes to advance UAS technology. So they have been uh, being very successful in testing and evaluating UAS in different use models. Um, in fact, I mentioned the four that, uh, that just were successfully flew this, this month. FAA's role in this program is that we're a facilitator. Uh, with these programs, and one of the, the benefits we receive from the tech center's perspective is the receipt of data. So uh, that data allows us to do more modeling and simulation and understanding. But to really get to the, to the point of your question, uh, they've been working in the areas of detect and avoid, command and control, navigation, weather, and examples of their use um, that they've been uh, approved for is beyond visual line of sight, package delivery, which we had a successful flight this, this month, I believe it was for a long-range flight of package delivery, I think it was medical supplies, um, inspection of infrastructure, as well as patrol and surveillance. Yeah, okay. And then uh, um, for, uh, is it, I'm sorry, we met yesterday, but uh, is it Prevo or Previt? Prevo, yeah. Prevo. And is it Beavert or Bevert? Bevert. Okay, it's Larson. Um, <laughs> so it's all clear. Um, so for, uh, uh, Dr. Prevo and Mr. Bevert, uh, given what you heard about the progress on IPP, are you able to use that, <clears throat> utilize that information? Is that information helpful to you as you're thinking ahead about conceptually? Let's start here. Yeah, so Uber is actively participating in the IPP with our drone delivery efforts uh, for, for Uber Eats. And we um, anticipate that we can carry the learnings that we get from the IPP also into our aerial ride-sharing um, initiative as well. So, so we think it is extremely helpful. Uh, it is also, we are very pleased with the uh, support that we're getting from the FAA and the collaboration that we're getting in the IPP so far. So yes, I would say that's an extremely useful initiative. Yeah. Uh, we, we agree that it's a very useful initiative, and we look forward to carrying the learnings into our work on aerial mobility. Thank you. That's great. Um, so, um, I think also for for both of you, uh, uh, and actually uh, for Ms. Scott as well, uh, has the newly written Part 23 regulations for GA aircraft uh, has that been helpful to you, or how and how are you using it if you're using it at all? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the uh, Part 23, Amendment 64, uh, has been transformative in our ability to um, move forward expediently with, with the FAA. The FAA has been incredibly supportive, and uh, they're really leaning in and very proactive and forward thinking on embracing uh, these new modes of technology, which will really fundamentally re revolutionize how we move as a society. Yeah. Yeah, the same. Uh, we are working with um, manufacturers who, who build aircraft uh, for us, uh, five manufacturers, Embraer, Bell, uh, Pipistrel, Aurora Flight Sciences, and Carim, and, and we expect all five of them uh, certainly to benefit from these, uh, from the Part 23 regulations as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ms. Scott? 
We haven't been involved with Part 23. Using, okay, all right, thanks. Um, uh, and maybe for, uh, this is a somewhat sarcastic question, but it gets to a point. So if you're gonna have thousands of these um, air taxis flying around, will you take the complaint, the noise complaint calls so I don't have to? Okay, in other words, uh, how are you gonna address, it's not just numbers, it's, uh, you know, it's noise. Uh, it could be, potentially. So how are you addressing, uh, thinking about that? Yeah, so uh, second to safety, noise is uh, our very, very high priority, and uh, we've consider it, considered it both in the overall vehicle architecture and also the design of every, the, every one of the subcomponents on the aircraft, uh, and uh, we're incredibly pleased with the progress. We, uh, our aircraft is now more than 100 times quieter than a helicopter. Uh, it's really, really spectacular. When it's flying over, you can barely hear it. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, and at, at what altitude? Uh, at a thousand feet. Thousand feet. Yeah. Um, in a, in a city, you can't hear it at all. It's only if you're in the countryside. Uh, I care very passionately about noise. Uh, I grew up in um, out in the mountains where it was just absolutely pristine quiet, and I I love the quiet. And so, as an engineer developing these tools, um, this was this was my childhood dream and to to build VTOL aircraft. And when I started working on this more than 25 years ago, I realized that VTOL aircraft were incredibly noisy when they were powered by combustion engines. And uh, so I, I wanted to build an electric VTOL, but battery specific energy wasn't what it right. needed to be. And I needed to wait uh, for the batteries to get to the point where we could build a, a really quiet uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft that allows us to really transform transportation as we know it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I'm out of time, but the other members will have similar questions, I'm sure. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Rick. S Sam? No, Bob? Thank, thank you, Chairman. I think when I was five years old, my favorite TV show was The Jetsons. I don't know if this is what's going to happen or not. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Yock, is that say? Uh, in your testimony, you discussed a roadmap for a full unmanned aircraft integration into the national airspace system, including operation beyond the visual line of sight for the operator. Can you provide, a, provide us an update on the progress of the integration in that? From a research perspective, um, because that, that's pretty much what we do, the, uh, the U.S. integration path for research uh, is, is pretty much a step path, but it, it's not linear. We can do that in parallel. So you're absolutely right. We're looking at research for operations over people, beyond visual line of sight, uh, package delivery, and then that brings us to the next stage, which is on expanded operations, uh, large cargo delivery of packages, and then ultimately to uh, pa passenger transportation. So that, that's our, our guideline, and we're doing a lot of research in different areas. For instance, research that we're doing that's going to enable UAS integration as well as uh, support urban air mobility is research in the command and control area. So the command and control is the data link between the pilot and the aircraft. So we're doing research in, from that perspective of uh, frequency levels, the minimum operational performance requirements necessary for that data link to ensure the integrity of that link to allow us to integrate these aircraft into the system. I, I guess for anybody in the panel, just a, a further, um, is technology there where we have a collision avoidance um, technology that, could t that the, the equipment, that the aircraft itself could take action without, on its own, to, and it, what was the technology for that? If you got all these things flying around like the Jetsons, I guess, you know. If, you, if anybody in the room can remember the Jetsons, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Congressman Gibbs, thank you for your question. Uh, so as, as we talked about, initially we will uh, deploy these as piloted aircraft, but from day one they, uh, they have a sensor suite that's on, in, embedded on those aircraft that is unprecedented. We have uh, cameras, infrared sensors, LIDAR, radar, and so they, they can uh, sense the environment around the aircraft in uh, really an unprecedented and exciting way. And over time, as we prove to ourselves and to the FAA that uh, these technologies will make those aircraft and the operation of those, of those aircraft safer than uh, with the pilot, we will begin to add in um, protections uh, similar uh, to what you see in, in maybe a level three car where um, it's, it's a safety net uh, around the aircraft and, and it will um, help the pilot uh, in the case that maybe there's a small drone and you don't see it, but the, the aircraft can see it and can avoid it. 
So uh, we see incredible technology, technological progress as we move forward. Uh, what, what do you see the cost, you know, I, I, you know, this moves on, the cost should come down, but what, what do you think you're looking at here and when this starts becoming more readily available? Yeah, so again, cost and accessibility to everyone is the core of our mission. Uh, when we uh, first launched this service, we're targeting the price of a taxi. Uh, and so the, the price for the, for the trip will be on par with the, the price of a taxi, taxi trip. And over time, we, uh, we believe that we can get the cost down below the cost of personal car ownership. And at that point, this is transformational, yeah. and uh, everybody will ride it every day. That's, that's uh, pretty exciting. What, uh, I'm just, just curious on a, on a timetable, how, how far do you think we're looking out? Is this five, 10 years, 15 years, or what do you think to really uh, see the, the integration of this? Yeah, so we're, I mean, we are, uh, we are currently working through uh, certification, and we have an incredible collaboration with the FAA, uh, and that's moving uh, very rapidly. Uh, and uh, once once we are, uh, we have a, a clear path to finalize the certification, we will ramp production and begin to roll out in cities across the country. So, so right now, it's really the government regulations, bureaucracy. We want to say that's that's the limiting factor, or is it technology, or is it, it cost, uh, or what? The the it's really about uh, my company doing the rigorous work, my team doing the rigorous work to ensure that we've tested every single component and uh, every corner case to make sure that this is the safest aircraft we can possibly put into production. Um, we, we are building in levels of redundancy which are uh, really unprecedented in small aircraft uh, to make this incredibly safe. Uh, safety is our number one priority. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, and you Thank back. You. Peter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Ms. Yak or Mr. Miracle, uh, I mentioned 336 at the outset. I mean, we've had 100, 100, average of 100 monthly reports of uh, drones in controlled airspace, and I just talked about the suspension, most recent suspension in my district of firefighting because of, so remote ID will fix that, but are there uh, other issues uh, with uh, drone operations other than remote ID that need uh, addressing by the FAA? Yes, thank you for your question, Ranking Member DeFazio. Fundamentally, um, we have two barriers. The first is the airspace rules need to apply to everyone equally in the airspace. And as you mentioned, Section 336 does limit the FAA's authority in that area. We believe that repeal of Section 336 is vital to being able to consistently apply all the airspace rules to all operators in the area. And that, in turn, will allow remote identification our next step in integration of drones or urban air mobility or any of these other exciting technologies to be truly fully functional and useful because then every aircraft will be able to see every other aircraft in the area, which will be fundamental to safety. And I mean, my amendment does both remote ID and it, it does say to the extent necessary to ensure safety and security of U.S. airspace. I mean. Uh, I think we've heard now from four agencies that want to be able to shoot down drones on their own. Uh, have, have you uh, been in communication with them? It's DHS, DOD, DOE, and... Uh, we, we have been. Um, we support... We, the FAA, do not want the authority to uh, interdict or provide counter UAS measures. We support uh, Department of Defense and Department of Energy having those capabilities now. We also support the administration's proposal to have the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice have that same authority. Mm -hmm. But there are also concerns with what uh, technologies they might use and how that might affect legitimate nearby commercial operations or general aviation aircraft. Yes, we work closely with our security partners to ensure that whenever they're employing counter UAS measures, that they coordinate with us and ensure that, uh, that, we, do, that we do not introduce a hazard into the airspace. Okay, I uh, want to be certain of that. So, um, the, uh, my, I have a provision in 3 uh, regarding 336 in the House bill. Would that fix the problems as far as the FAA is concerned? 
Uh, I'm generally familiar with that, and yes, that does give the FAA the authority that we believe we need. Okay. Uh, any of the other panelists want to express any concerns about uh, the current state of uh, sort of where we're unregulated, totally unregulated uh, for all uh, drones? Yes, I would just add support for uh, Mr. Merkel's position and that we also agree with that position that all uh, aircraft need to be regulated and registered and we need the remote identification capability. Uh, it's a critical foundational element for any sort of universal traffic management system um, for providing safe integration and for allowing our customer, our commercial operators, um, the comfort and feeling that they, they are following the laws and everyone else in the airspace will as well. Okay. Uh, we also believe that it's important to have federal preemption and uh, we, um, although we're, we're putting sensors on the aircraft that can um, help to mitigate uh, unregistered drones, it uh, would definitely be preferable if uh, all aircraft flying in the NAS were uh, part of the NAS. Okay. Doctor. I can only second that uh, remote identification to me is key for us to uh, being able to basically uh, deconflict our flight paths from everybody out there first. We need to be able to see them to, to avoid them. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, just one quick question, uh, Ms. Yak or uh, Mr. Merkel. Uh, we, you know, the FAA has been working on uh, the conflicts, and uh, when I asked a couple of years ago what happens, you know, when you ingest a drone into a jet engine, you, the answer was, well, gee, we really don't know. Uh, I mean, since then we've done the airframe testing. When are we going to do the engine ingestion test? Oh, thank you. I'll answer that. Uh, we've partnered with Assure, our centers of excellence, to do that work. They have completed phase one, which was basically an analysis of a drone versus birds, and, and we have a lot of data on the birds. Mm -hmm. So so the conclusion of that, that um, phase one was, um, well, they are different than birds, and that from the, the uh, batteries, the cameras, the, the motor itself, what effect would that have? So starting this fall, we're moving into phase two. And we will then be uh, live testing by ingesting the, those components as well as full drones into a fan assembly. Um, we'll be gathering data from, from that experience and then we'll be putting it into modeling and simulation. Better yet, we're using simulations from the manufacturers on their fan assemblies to be processing that data so that we can better analyze and understand the effects uh, those components have or full UAS have on fan assemblies and be able to produce our, the results of this research in about 12, 12 month, 18 month time frame. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, Bruce, do you have questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is kind of a general question. Is, uh, you know, as we have this debate, I can't help but think about the Jetsons and the George Jetson uh, commuting to work. But how, how does this physically work? Is there like lanes in the sky or how do you, how do you manage traffic flow? How do you avoid uh, obstacles, um, birds, uh, drones, all those things that might be there? How, do, how does this... Uh, technically work? Well, I can, <clears throat> maybe I can start. Um, this, is, this is a very good question, and I don't think there's a real simple answer to this. Um, but uh, we are working with NASA and with the FAA to evaluate different concepts on how to do this. And, and one of the concepts that we are uh, somewhat excited about is, is what we call like dynamic sky lane networks, since you mentioned uh, lanes. Uh, you can think of it as a virtual network of um, lanes, overpasses, on-ramps and off-ramps, essentially, that can be uh, adjusted to where the traffic needs are, um, to where uh, safety and security concerns might be, where, where noise com um, requirements uh, exist, and also where the demand needs to go. So in a sense, uh, you can think of it kind of as a three-dimensional road system in the sky that uh, you can utilize uh, for your uh, traffic. That's one of the concepts that we're pursuing. Okay. We're also doing uh, extensive work on uh, 
dynamic flocking and simulations for high density operations in and around uh, takeoff and landing locations. Uh, we're very optimistic about the capacity of the airspace to handle uh, large amounts of traffic. But it would be some kind of dedicated path that you would be on in your flying vehicle? Uh, yes, but, but uh, with the virtue of being able to be dynamically allocated and uh, adjusted, uh, you, you think, you know, in some, some bridges they'll move the, the center line depending upon the traffic patterns in the morning versus the evening. Right. Um, mm -hmm. In the sky, the, the road can go wherever we need it to, get, to go whenever we need it to go, right? And uh, there, there are many constraints, uh, weather constraints and, uh, and demand constraints that can allow this to, uh, to be very flexible. And that's, that's the, the real virtue of this. I, I think there's, there's also a, a massive opportunity um, because uh, air traffic doesn't require the ground infrastructure and the, and the hundreds of billions of dollars we spend maintaining ground infrastructure. Um, that's one of the things that makes it such a co cost-effective uh, mode of transportation, both for the individual customers, but also for us as a nation. Uh, do, so do you envision some kind of a, a master control program that, and each individual has equipment on it so that it keeps uh, vehicles out of the path of other vehicles? Uh, we believe that it's a network of, um, of interconnected systems um, uh, similar to uh, what Ms. Scott uh, spoke about. I think we think of this concept of universal traffic management as a system of systems or more of a distributed network like the internet uh, or like a wireless network where no one company or entity is controlling the internet, but we have a set of technical standards that allow for interoperability. We have a lot of connectivity options. It could be LTE, could be Wi-Fi, could be satellite, ADSB, depending on the type of routing that you need. So you have connectivity and you have dynamic routing. And then we're relying on the regulator to provide the performance-based criteria for how we need the aircraft to operate safely and integrate with each other. But we're bringing the technical standards and that know-how to provide interoperability. And just. Uh Briefly, Ms. Yak, on the uh, uh, the Part 77 process, uh, how will the um, integration of drones and flying cars affect the Part 77 process? And any idea on how this might affect land development? Um, I think the integrate or the integrated pilot program is going to be instrumental in helping us understand that because that's really a collaboration between your local communities and the airspace users and the IPP is really the point where um, we get to uh, work with companies like Uber and, and uh, Joby and the local communities and determine what is the best balance between um, airspace utilization and issues like privacy, land use, and, and uh, local concerns, such as noise. And um, we expect the IPP to be very informative in those areas. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Brownlee, questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Shack, I wanted to ask you, um, a question, can you tell us about um, what research the F FAA Technical Center um, is doing to test the safety of these new technologies that we're learning about today? And, and can you comment uh, also if there are similarities or if there are differences for testing the safety of unmanned versus manned aircraft? Yes, thank you, uh, very good question. Uh, before I start talking, I'd like to set, put the, uh, the assumptions out there, and you've heard a few of them. Uh, urban air mobility, uh, vertical takeoff and landing, that's the, that's the, uh, the technology that I'll be using. Um, it, it's also going to be using electric or battery propulsion. 
and um, we're, we're talking about initially being manned flight, but eventually being autonomous. <clears throat> the research FAA does, and the reason behind the research that we do, is to collect the information, the data, and provide the scientific analysis to be utilized for future regulations, guidelines, or procedures. So that sets the foundation. Now, I mentioned in my opening remark, some of the research that we're doing on large aircraft also apply to these aircraft, like the materials, lightweight materials, composites, uh, propulsion, electric, and, and batteries. So the research question in support of this technology is, what are the performance measurements or requirements for these technologies and materials and batteries? Another good example is the research that we do from a weather perspective. So uh, we, we do a lot, a lot of research around what is the weather information pilots need to operate, and we're doing a gap analysis for UAS. But the research question for somebody is, what is the effect of weather in an urban environment? What about wind gusts? What effect will that have on this new type of aircraft, let alone cold on the, on the longevity of batteries? So, so these are the type of what ifs. Now, in regards to the second part, what are we working on? Again, it's a lot about the uh, digital interface, the links between the pilot and, and the aircraft, the, uh, the sensor technology uh, between the aircraft's ground, eventually satellite, that allows us to know where the aircrafts are so that we can stay well clear and provide <coughs> that information for the pilot, but um, we're focusing in those areas. Thank you, and to the panel, in terms of what Ms. Yak said about the what ifs, does, do the what ifs have impacts on what you're doing today in terms of moving forward with your innovations? Yeah, as, as uh, we've, we've spoken about, the uh, safety is really our number one priority, and uh, ensuring that's both the safety of uh, the individual aircraft and also the operation of, of the service as a whole. And uh, we, the, the work that the FAA Tech Center has done and uh, the, the collective aviation industry um, over the past 100 years has created the, the safest transportation system in the world. So not only is air travel the fastest and the lowest cost, but also the safest, uh, our safest mode of transportation. It's really stunning and um, incredibly grateful to um, the, the work of this committee and the FAA um, over a long period of time, which has steadily improved safety. And I think it's, it's incredibly commendable and uh, really spectacular, the achievement. Is there anything that the FAA is not doing that is impeding your progress with regards to the, um, the tech center? I, I think the, uh, the, the FAA has been incredibly supportive, very forward-looking, um, very innovative, and in embracing um, these new technologies and, and looking how to make them as safe as we possibly can. Very good. Any comments, Mr. Provo? Uh, um, I think uh, I just want to um, back up to the weather problem. I, I do think there's, there's research that has to be done that's not tech center research, but uh, I don't think we, we have enough of an understanding about the microclimates in, in urban areas. And, and so, so there's certainly a gap that needs to be filled. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I just have a few more seconds, but Ms. Yak, uh, I noticed that the Drone Advisory Committee has changed somewhat in terms of membership, and uh, so I just wanted to know, given those changes, it, can we expect that? What can we expect uh, the DAC to uh, focus on in the in the near term? Yes, thank you for that question. The Drone Advisory Committee is being uh, somewhat reconstituted, but I was at the last meeting. And uh, it's still very active, and it's very much focused on how can industry help the FAA with the integration of these exciting technologies. So I believe they're at the stage right now of identifying how industry can help. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doug? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, for Ms. Yak and Mr. Merkel, uh, uh, I represent a very, very rural district in Northern California, most of which is on fire right now. Um, a new one last night turned into 15,000 acres in about 10 hours. Um, so the the use of, uh, of drones and aircraft that can remotely um, 
do the type of work needing to be done, expecting power lines, especially with that interface with forestry or dams, anything that's very remote, very tough terrain, you, you know, sending them in for uh, uh, helping to spot fires where visibility is not good for normal aircraft. It, it's, a, it's a great tool for many, many areas in remote and, again, rugged terrain. Um, but uh, what is the current status of uh, uh, allowing more beyond the, the line of sight technology with drones being approved by FAA and uh, being able to be more widely used, um, you know, other than what you have in the military and, and other limited uses, something that could be used more, more privately with proper certification, et cetera? Thank you for the question. Uh, we have, we are currently operating flight, or our partners are operating flights that are beyond visual line of flight. We're uh, working with BNSF, the railroad. They're doing linear inspection under a COA. So we're seeing progress there. We also- Is that more of a pilot situation or is it becoming more mainstream, widespread, et cetera? It's setting the foundation mm -hmm. for spreading that technology and those procedures to other operations. Likewise, we recently had a flight at NASA, no chase COA. Um, which was operating in the airspace with other manned aircraft. So it's really a major step towards um, full integration into the airspace. But again, this is why remote ID and revocation, or excuse me, repeal of three, Section 336 are so important, especially in those rural areas where you would likely see general aviation or crop dusters or other things operating at the same altitudes with these type of aircraft, it's very important that all the operators in the airspace see each other. Uh, with the ID uh, you were talking about, and I think Mr. Trefazio brought up uh, initially too, um, how, how far and wide can that aircraft ID, I mean, to every, you know, uh, <laughs> toy store drone, or I mean, how, how far can we go with this stuff in order to have it not uh, be impractical, but also be helpful with, um, you know, people with these vehicles. Like he mentioned the one, somebody fooling around near a fire zone up there in Oregon that uh, completely shut down the operation. It could have been as simple as just a, uh, a toy store drone or something like that somebody was fooling around with. What, how, do, how, how do we, how, how far down can we regulate or track every single vehicle like this? We would certainly like to track it at, at a minimum down to the same requirements that we have in part 107. Um, the 55 pound potentially uh, it, there may be some different performance characteristics that come in as people develop new aircraft we might have to revisit that but we're currently uh, in the process of um, we were post the aviation rule committee on the remote ID and we're in the process of developing a, a rule on that and I expect that some of those details will come out in the notice of proposed rulemaking. Do you anticipate then some type of a, de a device on every possible drone putting out a signal of some sort? That, uh, we do, much like every car has a vehicle identification number and all of us who drive them have registration and license plates. We believe, based on the recommendations from the Aviation Rule Committee, every drone should have an identification. And, a, a, um, a, a transmitting signature. You know. Transmitting a signal and, and um, available via network to all the other uh, operators in the airspace. Okay, with all this uh, flying car business being talked about, um, every prototype ever seen is neither good at being a car or at being an aircraft. They're either they're very low performing as a car and low performing as an airplane. So how how is this integration with you know uh, purpose aircraft? You know the modern private pilot type planes with the integrating and in, you know the the lanes we're talking about with um, a with an aircraft that can not perform nearly at that level, as well as when you put it on the street, I mean, you know, you've got wings and everything. What, what is the practicality of, of trying to do both in one vehicle? We have a... And, no and, and up in the airspace with other higher speed, you know, more normal aircraft. Right, that is, that is a challenge of the integration of these vehicles, but much like we integrate helicopters in busy metropolitan areas or general aviation, which have very different performance characteristics from a passenger jetliner. We believe that the concepts like uh, under UTM and, and the dynamic routes are, will provide us with the structure that will allow us to safely um, 
manage these aircraft in the airspace. Fundamentally, the, the routing addresses the structure and procedures portion that allows safe integration, and the automation behind UTM allows that solution to scale to the number of drones. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Andre, questions? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, when we talk about operating drones uh, beyond the operator's line of sight, uh, that means pretty much relying on some high-tech computer software and other technology. After we've all seen the staggering number of flight delays or even cancellations in the past few years during um, very high-profile um, computer allergies, particularly with, with Southwest and even Delta, I wonder what risks there are or there may be for drone and even UAS systems uh, as it relates to similar outages. Um, and secondly, what are the lessons learned from the airline outages from, from, from our subcommittee perspective and your perspective, and what could be done to prevent these outages and future sloppy housekeeping? And are drones subject to mass outages? We're in the very early stages of uh, UAS traffic management. We're really moving from the NASA research and the concepts into um, operationalizing that. So the specifics on how we design the availability really aren't, aren't there yet. However, we do know that um, the concepts behind UTM, such as a distributed network and many actors, are much more resilient than, say, a single data center. Mm -hmm. So we believe that um, there, the concepts have the kind of resiliency built into them, and as we partner with um, companies like Uber and Joby and Skyward, I believe that their innovation and what they bring to the table will provide the solutions that, that bring that um, resiliency. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also key for us to uh, design our systems for exactly these cases so, so that even if, if outages were to occur and, and, and the drones were disconnected from the network that we could be uh, sure that we can still safely land them um, in, in safe locations. Okay. Thank you. Anything from the engineering mind? <laughs> I uh, wholly agree that a dis distributed uh, and uh, with uh, diverse communications and, uh, and then additionally with, uh, with the aircraft able to uh, fly and, and land themselves safely and deconflict safely um, without the centralized control system. So multi-layered um, redundancy is really, really uh, important. Okay. Gentle ladies, nothing. All right. I yield back, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Scott, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Merkel, Pennsylvania has faced a series of disruptive weather events this year, resulting in a lot of power outages. One utility in the district I'm privileged to represent, PPL, uh, has used UAVs effectively in the recent storms and flooding events to assess dangerous situations and reduce response times. Uh, they did this without the benefit of beyond uh, visual line of sight of capability, as you know, improved safety and response time for power restoration. And of course, I urge the FAA to continue to work as directed by Congress to give utilities the ability to employ the beyond the, the visual line of sight operations to respond in emergency situations, as well as routine maintenance and inspection efforts, et cetera. But short of uh, beyond vi uh, visual line of sight, hurdles remain for utilities use of UAVs even within the line of sight in Class C airspace. And I'm just wondering, uh, I certainly understand, I'm a, I'm a helicopter guy, so uh, I understand the sensitivity in Class C airspace. Is there some way utilities can be granted a blanket approval to fly the UAS below the energized utility? So we're talking power lines. I don't know that any commercial or otherwise, quite honestly, other than the military, is flying below the utility, uh, even in even in you know Class C or other towered airspace. So we are working towards that goal. Uh, as I said, the BNSF uh, partnership has identified the kind of underlying technologies that will make that capable to that capability possible throughout the, the airspace. And really it comes down to the specific utilities and companies coming in and applying to the FAA and working through. 
These cases tend to have um, unique characteristics around them, and so it does take some human judgment and collaboration with the, the applicant to figure out the safest way to integrate, but we are actively integrating aircraft like this in Class B, Class C, Class D airspace all throughout the NAS. So is that something that they can apply for now? Uh, yes, it is. Is that right? Okay. It is, and we right. have companies doing similar things now. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bivert, Bivert? And Ms. Scott, I'm just curious, regarding the remote ID and tracking, is, are we talking about current transport, transponder technology with the Mode C, or are we talking, talking about something completely different for, for that? Most current technology is not going to be suitable for the smaller drones, um, but the uh, Remote ID uh, Aviation Rulemaking Committee that uh, Mr. Merkel referenced, we also participated on that committee and made recommendations for technical implementations that can meet the performance criteria that the FAA would like, and there are a number of different ways that that can be done. Uh, there are also a couple of different technical standards bodies, ASTM, 3GPP, CTA, that are also working on technically how can we adapt existing technology for these different form factors. So just, you know, the guy that's curious, and I think probably other people are too, are we talking like cellular tech? I'm, I'm, I'm picturing like a transponder head, right? And then the, the, you know, the radio itself is either right there in the console or it's in the back and it's heavy and, you know, and so on and so forth. So are we talking cellular technology or something other than that? What, what are we talking Certainly about? cellular technology and cellular connectivity is an option for providing that kind of connectivity. And I would... And, and then there's also in the near term uh, ADSB. Of course, ADSB has its limitations, but uh, it it will uh, it's getting deployed rapidly currently on the existing aviation fleet, and uh, it it provides a, an important first step. And just out of curiosity, um, I, you know, this is a commercial enterprise, and I think it's a fascinating uh, concept to to just ponder and and to see happening. And I, I, I'm I'm assuming you're that you're planning on all-weather all weather capability, right? It sounds like it, right? So I'm picturing, I'm picturing myself like wanting to get in this machine, right, that doesn't have a pilot in it, and there's a thunderstorm. You, you can see it coming, right? I mean, you've been in the aircraft when, when, the, when, the, when the, you know, it's one thing maybe sitting in the back, but when the rain is pounding on the windscreen at a, a buck 20 or whatever you're at, it is unnerving. And, and what is the, I mean, do you do, you do like uh, customer surveys or studies or, you know, I would think this would be somewhat fearful for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the, the weather research and uh, the, the sensing, uh, there's a lot of really exciting sensing uh, methodologies, airborne LIDAR, um, that uh, give the aircraft the ability to uh, see vertical wind shear and uh, uh, see uh, thunderstorms that you can't, uh, the human eye can't see. Um, but I think before uh, you're you're getting into an autonomous aircraft in a severe weather uh, situation, uh, there's a huge amount of work that has to be done on the uh, art artificial intelligence algorithms to uh, prove that they can make decisions around weather that are better than a, a human pilot. And I think that that will be many years to come. My time's expired, I thank you. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you, I appreciate you for many of your votes. Uh, one time, they, they, one of these magazines paired the Democrat who voted most with the Republican, and I was with you. So to, to do your, you don't have to run for re-election, so I can make it more public now. I'll have to work on that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, I was honored though. Thank you and Mr. Larson for holding this hearing. The emergent drone industry is uh, gonna make big difference in our country and it's imperative we set the framework right. Um, we've also got to pass the FAA authorization before the September 30th deadline. That's the big work of our committee. As a matter of health and safety, I urge the Senate to adopt the CDAC provision included in House bill that was passed HR 4. The U.S. Court of Appeals found that the FAA's justification to not review the safety risks of more cramped passengers as vaporous. And now the Inspector General is auditing the FAA for its failure to take the issue seriously. There is a safety and a health problem with the size of seats, the pitch of seats, and all of that, and the FAA needs to do its duty and make sure people can evacuate airplanes in the required time. 
We need to pass a long-time FAA authorization and include the SEED Act that was passed unanimously by this committee and overwhelmingly by the full House. In May of this year, Memphis was one of 10 areas selected out of 150 applicants to participate in the Department of Transportation's Drone Integration Pilot Program, and I was honored to be at the uh, announcement. Um, according to the Department of Transportation, the potential economic benefit of drone integration into the national airspace will be upwards of $82 billion and create up to 100,000 new jobs. Big news for Memphis and the nation. In Memphis, some of these airspace integration demonstrations include airport, runway and aircraft inspections, perimeter surveillance and geofencing, medical device and consumer package delivery, and environmental protection efforts such as coastline erosion detection. The airport authority is partnering with industry giants like FedEx, General Electric, Intel, and others. Just this past Thursday, 901 drones, FedEx, the Memphis Fire Department, and others included officials uh, visiting Memphis from the FAA successfully completed a demonstration of important perimeter geofencing safety measures to keep drones from flying into the designated <laughs> zones and critical safety redundancies to keep the public safety and airport operations unaffected. Drones have boundless real-world applications, and Memphis is now at the center of this rapidly growing industry. Uh, it's important we keep, get the policy framework right. It has to be absolutely positively right, as FedEx would say. First question is for Director Yak. University of Memphis is a close partner in the Memphis Drone Program and brought to light an insightful concern. The role of local municipalities is not mentioned in the hearing summary of subject matter. It seems clear that local municipalities will play a large role in future airspace integration efforts. While programs such as the FAA's integration pilot program go a long way toward helping that develop, does the FAA have any plans to work with Congress or request Congress to help communities develop the necessary infrastructure that will allow potential benefit of drones to be realized. I was checking with Jay because I thought that actually fell in, into his arena. Um, the the uh, FAA is, uh, I, I think the DOT and FAA, as you can see by the establishment of the integration uh, pilot project, is understanding and seeing that there, there's a wild world out there. Wide, not wild. And, and what I mean by that is whenever you take technology uh, regulation, particularly from a safety perspective, you need to look at it from a societal um, perspective too. What is the impact on society? What is allowed? And what what should the, the rules be? Uh, we, we are progressing in, in a number of partnerships with industry as well as with the, uh, the local governments and that to be able to understand this world that we're entering in. From a research perspective, we got the technology down. We're, we're, we're looking at that. We're looking at that with our partners. We're looking at that and how to better regulate. But it's the IPPs and the working with, with the local governments and the tribal communities to understand the use and then what are the, the ways to enable this technology in their area. I would just add to that, just as we do it with manned aviation today, we actively work with our local communities when we're um, planning uh, new airspace utilization projects. And so we would expect that to continue and act, as you pointed out, the IPP is critical to opening uh, those relationships with the local communities around drones and identifying the issues that are of concern to them and working with them. And we fully expect the, the research and the uh, actions coming out of the IPP to inform how we adapt and evolve to the future for, for the drones. Thank you. And I think my time's about up, and I came late, so maybe I, I'm, I'm taking a little risk. But Dr. Prevo, I understand you talked about Uber doing Uber Eats by drone? That's correct. How does, yeah. you know, I, about 30 years ago, I was in the state senate, and somebody showed me a phone. Of course, it was like this. It was gigantic. And he said, we're going to have like Dick Tracy, we're all going to have phones. And I said, you're crazy. Well, I was wrong. Yep. So Uber Eats by drone is just, I mean, does the drone go to the restaurant and then kind of knock on the door? And <laughs> how does it get in? I mean, the rendezvous downstairs. Mm -hmm. How does the drone get downstairs to get my ribs? To your balcony. <laughs> um, we are experimenting with different con-ups there that can involve our couriers as well. Um, in the process because, I mean, we, we already have a, a food delivery business and so the drone may also only take a portion of um, the uh, um, 
take the food from, from our courier to, to another courier, potentially on the other side, uh, or we can have fixed infrastructure. Part of our integration pilot program is, is experimenting with different CONOPs and seeing what works best. Uh, but the, the main idea is, yes, you push a button and you get your burger or sandwich a little bit faster. Well, I'm all for it. I use Uber Eats, and it's great. I just can't mm -hmm. imagine some drone going into a, in the future. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, I may have missed it at the at the beginning, but all this talk about uh, moving people and and uh, places, I hadn't heard any mention of Part 135 and what the impact uh, is uh, there. Can someone help to, to to lay out for me the from from an expert perspective what the evolution is going to be from? Uh, from uh, uh, the Part 135 requirements we have today for charter aircraft to the to the fact that I can climb in an Uber with absolutely anybody uh, today uh, and uh, and get uh, get to where I need to be. Yeah. So uh, as one of the things uh, we're planning on is to launch this our service uh, as a fully piloted aircraft mm -hmm. um, and uh, with with a professional pilot on board from mm -hmm. day one. And over time. Uh, we will, the, the, um, our sensing systems and our software systems will provide that pilot increasing levels of, um, of automation. Mm -hmm. um, and one day we may end up uh, flying these fully autonomous. But uh, we're really focused on, on operating fully within the existing Part 135 standards. And uh, we ex expect that uh, those, in, in our conversations with the FAA, um, it's been confirmed that uh, we have a path forward to launching this this service and this operation. Then I understand that within the current bandwidth of regulation, though there was a time I had to find somebody with a taxi medallion in order to do ride sharing, and now we trust a much broader uh, uh, pool of people. Do we expect, as we're training uh, autonomous, uh, uh, not autonomous, as we're play, as we're training remote uh, pilots, as we're as we're uh, uh, training more and more ordinary everyday drivers to be in the uh, in the sky? Do we expect an evolution in, in a regulatory framework, or are we expecting Part 135 to remain with us for, for a generation to come? We, we believe our current regulatory framework uh, can address these challenges and can be adapted to provide um, operating certificates for operators, type certificates for aircraft, and, and um, pilot licenses as well. Uh, it's really a matter of understanding what was intended by uh, a regulation like Part 135 and working with the applicant to ensure that their implementation meets the intent. Mm -hmm. And as you all are looking regulatorily and uh, uh, through the lens of technology, uh, do you expect me to be flying in an autonomous aircraft or in a remotely piloted aircraft first? I will let my colleagues answer that. So we believe that the, I mean, Uber is also intending to fly uh, with pilots first, uh, but the mode is probably going to be uh, more remotely piloted then, not necessarily uh, with a single pilot uh, for, per, per aircraft. Um, kind of as, a, as another transition period, actually overall, uh, we will manage our fleet very precisely because it has to integrate into a multimodal trip. We, we have the first mile, we have the last mile that we need to connect into. So there's really not as much flexibility for the aircraft to do anything themselves, at least in our model. We, we believe it's, it's going to be very highly uh, remotely piloted, but it might be remotely piloted by a largely automated system. The, and in order f to get the broad uh, adoption that we would all like to see, is the expectation that we're, we're, we're always going to be talking about uh, electric uh, aircraft, that, there, that we concede there is no place uh, for uh, combustion aircraft in, in airspace uh, uh, close, to, close to our homes? That, that's certainly our view that uh, both from um, an emission standpoint um, and even more importantly from an acoustic standpoint, mm -hmm that uh, fully electric is uh, necessary okay. to, uh, to make this technology ubiquitous. The, and given those range uh, challenges as they exist uh, today, a remotely piloted aircraft certainly seems to, to speak to ROI. If I could put two people in an airplane uh, to get to where they need to go instead of just, uh, instead of just one, uh, as, uh, as 
as you're looking for, for capital, as capital is, is being attracted to these ideas, where's that capital flocking uh, today? Is it, uh, is it on the autonomous side? Is it on the remotely piloted side? Is it all going to piloted uh, proof of concept uh, uh, projects? So our, our particular aircraft is a five seat. Right. So it has a, a single, single pilot uh, and four passengers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are fully electric, and that, as you mentioned, that reduces our, our range capabilities. We c today we can only fly about 150 miles mm -hmm. plus an FAA reserve, um, a 30-minute reserve uh, for safety, and uh, so that limits limits our operations to. Uh, this is not something you're going to take uh, uh, cross country, but we do have ambitions to be able to fly from DC to New York or from New York to Boston. Um, in the not too distant future. So we see huge improvements uh, coming on the, on the battery front that will uh, extend, that, extend that range and make this um, not just a, um, uh, you know, for one geographic area, but be able to network different geographic areas together, which we believe will have a really profound effect on the economy and the ability for uh, people in geographically disparate locations to um, communicate and work together more effectively. The, uh, thank you all for your, your pioneering work and your, and your expertise today. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Donald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman <clears throat> and the ranking member. Appreciate this uh, opportunity to be here. And um, uh, Ms. Yak, it's uh, nice to see you again. Uh, had the pleasure of touring the Hughes Technical Center uh, in Chairman Lobiondo's district a year ago and was uh, very impressed uh, with the work being done there. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, I represent a densely populated urban district. Noise from trucks, buses, Newark International Airport, and helicopters are a constant concern for my constituents. I'd like to hear, from the, uh, hear more about the FAA's work on noise mitigation research, specifically with regard to UAS and flying cars. Uh, <clears throat> I know we're getting in the future with George Jetson and his boy Elroy. Uh, and so, um, you know, obviously it's not very far off. Um, so, you know, I know it's really not a big issue now, but uh, as this technology becomes more common, uh, we should not be adding to this seemingly uh, interactable problem of aircraft noise in urban areas. Um, can you? Absolutely. Thank you for the, for the question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, balancing technology with community concerns is, is a very important part of the process. Uh, our, US, our UAS uh, implementation plan does include in it uh, obtaining and researching noise information, noise data. In fact, the uh, integration pilot program is also providing us the data regarding noise so that we can start using that noise information to start uh, analyzing it and determining how to use that information for certification requirements and, and, and affecting the, the aircraft uh, performance of the future. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to... Uh, oh, Jay said I hit all the points, so I must have done good. Oh. But I, I, my peers, yeah. I, I think uh, Yeah, if anyone else could elaborate, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, uh, so <coughs> the noise is uh, near and dear to my heart, and uh, specifically uh, for uh, operations in, in and around urban areas, uh, we expect it to be significantly below the background levels, such that uh, the aircraft operations will be um, inaudible. Uh, in uh, suburban and rural areas, um, the noise levels are very low, but um, they, but it will be able to, um, you will be able to hear the aircraft um, in a very quiet environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but for, for your constituents, uh, uh, we have done a huge amount of work, again, making these aircraft more than 100 times quieter than a helicopter. Yeah, because I mean, <clears throat> You know, if you get bad weather in Newark Airport, they shift the, the runways, and it comes right over the South Ward where I live. And, I mean, you, you think the wheels are going to hit the top of some of these homes, you know, uh, on the trajectory that they're coming in. And um, believe me, um, we really get hammered um, 
you know, about this and the helicopter issue in Jersey City has become a big problem. Uh, these tourist helicopters are flying closer and closer into um, areas across from New York to get the view. So they, they straddle the river in New Jersey and, you know, these uh, constituents are just going crazy. So um, it's something that is um, very important and, um, you know, I need to continue to stress uh, the need to continue to work on this. Um, <clears throat> so I see the potential for flying cars uh, to reduce the stress on our roads, infrastructure, and help mitigate congestion issues facing districts like mine. But I'm concerned on how the law enforcement and homeland security experts will deal with this emerging, um, emerging technology in the hands of bad actors. Uh, if you walk around the Capitol Hill, you'll see the curves and streets are lined with um, barricades in part to prevent cars driven, you know, by bad actors from accessing this critical space. Uh, how do we engineer our cities to deal with cars that can't be blocked by ordinary barricades? Um, what discussions um, is the industry having around that aspect. So uh, we can put up, uh, just like with cars, you can put up a physical barricade uh, because of the, uh, the control systems in these aircraft, you can actually put up digital barricades. And uh, so we can, we can constrain these aircraft so that the, the control system physically can't create a trajectory um, that can go where we don't want it to go. Um, so the aircraft can, whether it's uh, the pilot or uh, one of the passengers in the aircraft, if they try to um, to deviate from deviate the, well, from well, the tra tra trajectory, it just physically won't go. So these are these are digital barricades. What well, what happens to it? It just stops. Let, let let's say this is this is the barricade. You know, mm -hmm. this is this is the no fly zone. Mm -hmm. It will it will just uh, oh, it'll, find a trajectory um, around that. Oh, it'll force zone. it away from. Okay. All right. Well, um, that's pretty interesting, pretty neat. Um, well, with that, I'll, um, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lloyd, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Ms. Yak, uh, o over here. Um, I may have missed um, earlier testimony um, along the lines of my question been uh, back and forth between two hearings, but I wanted to specifically follow up uh, to your uh, written testimony in regards to UAS, uh, small uh, drones. Um, just as you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of commercial application. Entrepreneurs are finding more and more ways to use drones to make their operations more efficient. Two particular areas in my community, uh, agriculture for crop assessment, um, and then uh, inspecting infrastructure like power lines, for instance. Um, and, you know, I, I, what I hear from them is line of sight um, has, has been an issue, the ability to operate beyond uh, line of sight. Um, and I read in your testimony that there are, there's an ability to get waivers today. And I guess I want to understand a little bit more about that. Generally, who is receiving those waivers and, and for what purpose? How easy is it to get a waiver? And do you think we will be changing the regulations uh, to make that uh, easier? And I certainly understand the security concerns as well. We're seeing you know, potential use of drones uh, in, by terrorists or in, in other activities that we obviously don't want to see. But I'd just like to hear your uh, response to that. Uh, Mr. Merkel will respond to that. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the question. Let me first address the, the evolution. Last month, the FAA published an updated version to our UAS roadmap that, that plots the evolution towards um, beyond visual line of sight, package delivery, urban air mobility, passengers, that sort of thing. But fundamental to the fundamental next step and necessary next step is remote identification and the repeal of Section 336 because that allows us to identify every aircraft in the airspace. And um, then that will make it 
much easier to move towards beyond visual line of sight. We also have had recent success with flights, um, such as our partner BNSF, the railroad, which is now doing linear inspection beyond visual line of sight, no chase COA. So we're seeing that emerge. It really isn't tomorrow, it is today. And you're correct, it's uh, done via a waiver process, and yes, anyone can apply. And um, depending on whether you need a waiver for the aircraft or for airspace, you, you apply. Um, actually to the same website. Um, it's on the UAS website for the FAA, you apply. So, so it's a website application? And it's a website what is, what application, is the, yes, yeah. and then humans get the email. What, what is the criteria for receiving it, a waiver? Uh, the criteria for receiving a waiver it depends on what you're asking for. So it, it really does take case-by-case -case analysis for each waiver because it may have implications for the specific airspace you're in or other hazards or other things going on around there or the particular aircraft. So it really does take uh, human analysis at this point. But as we move down uh, the path towards UAS integration and we get things like remote ID and um, beyond visual line of sight, then the waivers will no longer be required. Yep. All right. Thank you. And a second question, uh, Mr. Prevot. Um, in regards to uh, the airline industry, there's a, today a severe shortage of pilots. Um, and I know that you had mentioned uh, in, in your testimony one of your key business challenges um, is pilot training. Um, and I'm just curious, with the introduction of uh, aerial ride sharing, um, do you think that will increase the demand for pilots? And how will you address the issue of a limited workforce? Yeah, it will definitely increase the demand for pilots as we want to operate for quite a while with pilots. Uh, and initially, um, I mean, we will um, only uh, utilize pilots that are certified by, by the FAA, starting with, with certified helicopter pilots, most likely. Uh, we would like to get um, the vehicles simple, simpler to, to be operated, so we might be able to extend this to fixed-wing pilots as well. And, and there, there might also be an opportunity to basically create a, a new training program and, and train up uh, new possible pilots for this job. This is a, a, a common issue that we hear about here in Congress. Do you have any suggestions for what we can be doing here to better address a labor force issue like this? Um, and I'm supportive of some of the single um, simplified vehicle operation type things. Great. Thank you. Can, can I uh, add something sure. to that? So uh, uh, one of our uh, investors is JetBlue, and uh, we're actually looking at this as a huge opportunity where uh, we can uh, provide a trading ground for, uh, for pilots that can then um, after flying with us for several thousand hours, um, transition and, and be, begin flying com commercial operations, uh, similar to the partnerships that uh, uh, 135 operators have had with 121 operators um, historically. And so there's a uh, really a fantastic opportunity to uh, drive a huge amount of interest into becoming pilots, and then for those pilots to have long careers in, in the 121 uh, operations. So we, we think this is a uh, a huge feeding ground and a really uh, spectacular opportunity, which Great. we're very excited to be working on. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Are you yielding back? Yes. Okay. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, very much appreciate this hearing. Always excited <laughs> to hear about uh, the subcommittee thinking futuristically, because it's happening anyway. So I'm very interested in autonomous cars and autonomous aircraft. This is a very controlled space in the nation's capital that I uh, represent. Um, recently, and I suppose this uh, first question is for Mr. Joby or perhaps Dr. Privet. Um, we have seen how with or without the Congress, and it looks like without, uh, autonomous cars are moving uh, some of them being tested on, on the streets. Uh, and there's been an occasional uh, mishap. That gets a huge, uh, if, if we had the kind of publicity that gets to the daily 
accidents on the road, we'd, we'd be reading nothing else in, in the paper. But what we do know is that these uh, autonomous cars are far safer than you or me uh, at, at the wheel. Given the fact that the public gets scared off, perhaps, by one single accident as we've had in the recent months, uh, how close are we to moving toward remote or pi pilotless uh, aircraft? Uh, is, this, is this still something that needs a lot of work? Uh, even though, to our credit, the subcommittee is thinking about what you're doing now. I mean, is this not anything that's going to happen within the next 10 years? Or what is your best estimate on, on that? Um, I think uh, there are many pieces in, in place. Aircraft basically today are flying highly automated already. Uh, but I, I believe we have to collect uh, a huge amount of data, actually, with uh, pilots on board to make sure that we can prove that these systems are ready to be autonomous, that we've covered all, all the cases. So, so that's kind of the approach that we're taking, having the pilots on board. And then uh, it may also not be a one-size-fits-all. It, it could be that, that we, we can prove that certain routes, certain circumstances are have never had a pilot, uh, the need for a pilot to intervene, and, and we've got everything covered there, so, so we can incrementally potentially start uh, removing the pilots from those vehicles. But, but I, I do think it is certainly several, a number of years out. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree that uh, the, the goal is to demonstrate, as you uh, spoke, spoke about, Congresswoman, uh, that it is, uh, these, these systems have the potential to be uh, much safer than than human piloted aircraft, uh, but we there are things that like weather, for example, that we talked about, where uh, humans and our cognitive abilities um, to make really complex decisions are are really re quite spectacular, and so we want to leverage the the skills that the and the capabilities that the human pilot um, has, as well as the skills that the autonomous and automated systems have, and so. Yeah. Well, I want you to help us think. Uh, for example, if there are autonomous cars and autonomous uh, aircraft, remember we have pretty close to autonomous planes, and autonomous uh, uh, underground railroad. We just had a spectacular accident here. I don't know about a dozen years ago, uh, with somebody at the wheel, but but our underground. Uh, subways basically drive themselves and have been doing so for a long time. And when a pilot gets in the air, you know, he's not <laughs> sitting there driving the plane. That plane is on automatic pilot as well. So, so it's pretty clear we're already there. But if we go to autonomous planes, then everybody can have an autonomous plane. Uh, you don't even have to drive it because now it's autonomous. Um, uh, we may get, be into, and Mr. Previtt un perhaps understands this, we may be into what we have here in the District of Columbia, and I would gain say perhaps uh, my colleagues have the same as well. Now we have a lot of congestion on the roads because anybody can get an Uber or a Lyft, and those of us who ride them are very glad they're out there. But, uh, Mr. Privet, what we've done here in the city is, or at least there's a proposal to put a tax on Uber and Lyft so that we can help fund our underground Metro, as we call it, our underground railroad, which is going <laughs> broke, so that we would have a choice uh, and not, not be left as we are now with one or the other. And what Uber and autonomous cars and the like provide are choices. Yet there may need to be a whole new set of traffic rules, a new set of who gets to drive. Perhaps we in the Congress ought to be thinking about this, or even more so at the local level. And I realize I'm asking you to think in the future, but that's what we're trying to do here today. So when you think about how we'd have to uh, deal with congestion, perhaps we'd have less congestion, perhaps in the air, perhaps we'd have more, perhaps we'd have fewer accidents, perhaps more. Who needs to be thinking about that? Who is thinking about these kinds of issues as we get excited about autonomous vehicles? You want to begin, Mr. Prep, Dr. Previtt? Um, yes, I, uh, I believe that uh, going to the Arab gives you more choices. 
because just like you said, I mean, now you've got another way of, of doing a multimodal uh, trip, and, and we certainly have to think about the congestion that it might create in, in the air, that it also might create around the, the sky ports uh, as we optimize uh, trips through our network. Um, we see Uber, for example, as a platform where we also want to integrate in with public transportation and with all these other means and, and, and really provide. So you understand why the, the district thinks that Uber ought to help us pay, pay for underground transportation even as we've had to make room for more Ubers on the road here? Well, I would say um, that's not necessarily my area of expertise. <laughs> you, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like you to submit to the chairman uh, what your uh, what those whose expertise it is to know about this think about using uh, some form of transportation to help fund another form of transportation, but go ahead. Uh, so I, I think that there's an incredible opportunity, just as, as Congress uh, uh, funded the, uh, our, our national highway system and then uh, funded uh, the construction of many of our airports, uh, there's an incredible opportunity here to, uh, as Congress looks forward, to think about how to support this uh, new and more efficient mode of transportation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the ranking member as well for having this hearing. Very, very informative. We are uh, indeed embarking on a brave new world here, which is uh, really, really exciting. But I do want to drill down a little bit has to, uh, you know, what I describe, and for lack of a better term, is, is the, uh, a common law nuisance. To make certain as we embark on flying cars or package delivery or whatever, however we use the, the airspace, that people aren't using their property to the detriment of the enjoyment of other people's property. And traditionally, um, that has been regulated at the local level, as you know. So whether we're talking about passenger uh, technology, as you have, or, or package delivery, or in the case of public safety um, or public use, um, the concerns of privacy. And I'll just give you a quick example. In San Francisco, we thought we could relieve congestion by putting these shared and dockless bikes on every corner. We have them in Washington, D.C. Now in San Francisco, they're saying, get them off. They're a, they're a nuisance. So, you know, the law of unintended consequences may have a, have a role to play here. So what I guess I would start with Ms. Scott on this. There is disagreement in the community on, on preemption, on who should control this so that we can maximize this, this brave new technology, as I say. Um, there are some at the Uniform Law Commission that came out that do not agree with the position of, of federal preemption on some of the regulations below the national airspace or below 300 or 400 feet. And there are others that say that's the only way to go. You've been looking at traffic management, obviously. How do you, how do you see a solution for this? Yeah, thank you for the question. We believe the FAA is best suited to provide regulatory oversight for all uh, aircraft in the airspace, uh, hobbyist, commercial, manned, unmanned, uh, passenger drones. And that there is also an important role for states and municipalities to play uh, in that. Uh, but we believe that there should be common operating rules. And just as there are for manned aviation, you have the FAA setting a federal regulatory framework, but you have an important role for states and locals to play in how they balance concerns around privacy protection. But if someone next to an airport is tired of their, their uh, you know, dishes being rattled every time a plane lands, um, they usually go to the local authorities first. And we agree that there is a role for state and local law enforcement in, with drones, which is why we're such proponents of the remote identification for all aircraft that would allow a local law enforcement to be able to look up and see and to easily distinguish who's a participant in the system and who might be a bad actor. You know, it cuts both ways, too. It's not just, oh, gosh, we've, we've got to allow the, the, the locals to, to regulate um, your particular industry or your endeavors, it cuts both ways. As I understand it, the low altitude authorization notification capability right now ha allows for single drone use. There was a group in my home state that wanted to use multiple drones for a, some air show or something, and they had to wait 100 days. So one common rule that, that has one jurisdiction across the country can actually operate to the detriment of what some of you are trying to do as well on the other side. Uh, Dr. Privet, let, let's 
get your, your input on, on all of this. Um, I, I do believe um, that it would be very difficult if we had very different regulations across the country, especially for, for people who want to operate uh, pretty much every, everywhere. Um, you mentioned the low altitude authorization notification capability. I think it could be extended to, to handle this, these other cases as well. We're, we're in the early stages of all this. And so, so I believe uh, we, we have to learn and see how the things work right now. So if somebody on Sunday morning at 5.30 is delivering a package to my next door neighbor and buzzing around my window or buzzing around my backyard picnic later that day, I should call the FAA. I think just as we have um, common operating rules for helicopters, but municipalities might set rules about operating hours for when a helicopter can land downtown on the designated helipad, I can envision a similar balance between state and local implementation of those rules with a common federal operating structure. I think yeah. the let me just interject there. I think we all agree that, that, that the common federal operating structure is you can't allow a local rule to interfere with interstate commerce or the national airspace. So a municipality can't just come in and say, well, let's just ban landings and takeoffs. That would obviously interfere. But below that, those rules and regulations, um, that's the question we're going to have to face in my view. And I would say that I think the UAS uh, integration pilot program is a great project for us to figure out how best to balance those local community concerns with federal operating rules and collect data and really real time see how does it work when you try no, I, to implement. I, I certainly agree with that. Thank you and I yield back. Jimmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And maybe some of what I am asking about has already been answered. I was in another committee hearing for the first, I guess the first hour or so. Uh, what, what I'm wondering about, though, is this tremendous explosion of, of drones in number. Uh, I understand that uh, the official FAA prediction on registered drones, it's now over uh, somewhere over one million, and it's going to be two and a half million by 2022. The growth has been so fast, though, over the last three or four years, I think that two and a half million may be a low estimate, and then I'm told by staff that there are tens of millions of unregistered drones that hobbyists have and so forth. Are, are we going to at some point see a day where there'll have to be some sort of limitation on drones? Or, I mean, they, they so far already exceed the number of fixed-wing aircraft. So if we have 100 million drones in this country in a few years, I mean, do, do you foresee a time when we're going to have to limit the number some way? Or, can, or is the number just unlimited? Uh, thank you for the question. Just as in manned aviation, we deal with capacity and efficiency all the time. Uh, there will eventually be some point where the airspace capacity will be reached. We don't know where that is or when that will be. But until we actually evolve the concepts around um, UAS traffic management, uh, we really won't know fully where those limits are. One of the fundamental principles of UAS traffic management is it uses automation to scale to the number of drones that we're anticipating. So we think we will get far more capacity for the airspace with um, concepts like UTM than is reachable with our traditional air traffic uh, control or air traffic management techniques. So we think the number will be much, much higher. But working with our partners as they evolve their concepts and they bring applications in, uh, we will all together move forward in understanding how to manage capacity and efficiency and um, safety, safely, excuse me. And I also have seen articles about concerns about privacy, and I'm wondering, uh, d does the FAA, uh, is the FAA set up, uh, uh, Mr. Lewis got into this a little bit, is, is it set up to uh, take, uh, accept complaints now about drones, and are you getting 
very few complaints, many complaints. I would imagine that uh, most people would call some local official. Uh, they, I, don't, I don't think their first thought would be to call a federal agency, but uh, are you getting complaints about drones now? We, we do, yes. Thank you for the question. We do get complaints. We get concerns. Um, our advice to anyone, particularly in areas of privacy or where they feel that a law has been broken, is to contact their local law enforcement first. That really is the best way to deal with these instances. Because, of course, the FAA's mission is civil aviation safety. So we have no authority to enforce you know, local privacy laws and that sort of thing. So always we refer them to uh, local law enforcement and we continue to try and educate the public that that's the correct way to deal with these concerns. And are the number of complaints, would you classify them as very few or very many? Are they, the numbers of complaints going up some or rapidly or? Unfortunately, that's a little beyond my particular expertise, but I'd be happy to work with you right. and your staff to get you the specific numbers. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, Shelley, is there any work being done at the, uh, at the tech center to address and mitigate the possible security risks posed by UAS and other emerging aircraft technologies? Uh, uh, yes, there is, um, particularly from a cybersecurity perspective. And the, the work that we're doing does not necessarily uh, begin and end with, with the drones. It's also for, for aircraft in, in general. And what I'm referring to is the establishment of a cybersecurity uh, safety threat and risk assessment methodology. And you may ask, well, you know, what does a methodology do? Uh, well, the methodology is the background, the, the procedures, the process that we use to be able to do risk assessments, uh, measure, measure what the risk is, what the vulnerability assessments are, what the threats are. Uh, by understanding what the threats are, then we can identify the mitigations. That's important uh, twofold. One, from an industry perspective, by understanding what the threats and the vulnerabilities are and what the potential mitigations are, they can start remedying them early in the life cycle. And from the FAA perspective, we can use that data for any rulemaking, certification, or guidelines. Now, uh, that's, the, that's the foundation for security and particularly cybersecurity. We're also looking at the technologies itself, again, with our industry partners, on uh, security protocols to be used in data links, on data exchange rates, uh, minimum operational performance on these systems that we've been talking about. Uh, cybersecurity is all about security and resiliency. The human aspect, if something happens, what is, what is the reaction? The data um, availability and accessibility. So that's, that's the type of research work that we're doing in regards to the cybersecurity and security of drones as well as urban air mobility aircraft. Uh, so Shelley, for you and really for anyone else on the panel, what technological developments must be implemented before these new aircraft technologies can be safely introduced or integrated into the NAS? So you've heard a lot about remote ID, and I would say that every panel member uh, here um, subscribed to the need for remote ID. We need to know where the aircraft is so that, that our pilots can stay well clear. Uh, we, we need the technology to understood and in place for sensors and frequency management, a communication between the aircraft, the pilot, the pilot in controlled space with the, with the uh, controller. Uh, th those are, are essential. I'm intrigued. I learned a lot from this panel. I enjoyed it um, as to the technologies that, that our, our colleagues are working on in the aircraft makeup itself. And we'll be uh, working with them closely on the performance requirements for those aircraft from the material they use as well as the, uh, the propulsion method. So there's a, a lot of work to do. I think the uh, UAS traffic management arena is, is blossoming well. Uh, we have a demo coming up in the 2019 uh, timeframe where the Technical Center will be working very closely with NASA on, on and industry. We'll be flying z uh, drones through our test sites and we'll be simulating drones out of our laboratory, our next-gen integration and evaluation capability laboratory. So that, that'll uh, be a, a, lot, a lot of learning and a lot of data that we can use for future uh, concept use and development. Uh, anyone else? No. Um, so a brief 
sort of statement and then a question, Ms. Scott, for you. A um, couple of years ago, we had a devastating superstorm by the name of Sandy, and we've also had some devastating hurricanes in Florida and Texas and Puerto Rico. And I was um, very impressed when Verizon undertook the initiative uh, to understand that in these devastating storms, uh, our ability to communicate is basically wiped out and witnessed in my district the uh, sort of the test of the flying cell tower on a drone, which was absolutely remarkable. So I want to commend you all for taking that initiative. But uh, listening this morning to some weather forecasts from back home, uh, there is a storm that's possibly moving up the East Coast next week that has the potential to be a hurricane, I'm not saying it is, which got me thinking, uh, is, is that sort of drone cell tower operational now or a limited basis, or where do we stand with that technology? Microphone. Excuse me. Uh, so the flying cell phone tower uh, work I am familiar with as an R&D project, and I know that the ongoing research into uh, characterizing how to do that, how the network performs, and, and what drones are suitable for that, that work is ongoing. Uh, I would be happy to refer you to uh, some of the experts who are working on that project more closely. Skyward is actually uh, used by Verizon to manage hurricane response operations. So we used Skyward to manage the deployments and uh, the drones that we used at Verizon to respond to Hurricane Irma and Harvey. That was more in a response surveying and an inspection capacity. Okay. The, obviously, the next two months are critical for hurricane potential. And I'd be curious as to a follow-up from your folks to know the capabilities if, in fact, we are hit with one of these again? I'd be happy to follow up with you. Okay. Rick? Thanks. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Scott, in your testimony, you said, for all its popularity, Lance is a point solution that mitigates a specific logistical burden. Uh, that being the case, um, what would be the top three steps needed then to uh, expand that or to get to the universal traffic management idea that uh, that you believe needs to happen. Great, thank you for that question. Um, we were the first uh, service supplier to be uh, approved to provide Lance as a service, and it's had tremendous uh, growth for, for the industry because it's opened up so many controlled airspaces uh, to be possible for drone use, for safe uh, drone access. What we'd like to see in terms of improvements for Lance specifically, um, first, it's still in beta, and the FAA has been tremendously uh, innovative in rolling it out and rolling it out quickly. We'd like to see it, it move into a full deployment with the robust and secure funding that it needs to maintain adequate performance. Uh, we would like to see the inclusion of DOD and federal contract towers uh, in the Lance system so that we can offer uh, safe authorization to those airspaces as well. Uh, and we'd like to see the ability to attach existing waivers to Lance authorizations. So a number of our customers might have an existing waiver, perhaps for night operations. Uh, and those authorizations uh, currently can't be attached to a Lance authorization. So that's just an additional system enhancement that would make it easier for our customers to get quick access to the places they need to fly. Um, Mr. Brevett, do you have the top three things that need to happen to get to a traffic management system that you all can take advantage of? The, <clears throat> I agreed basically uh, with the remote ID um, that was mentioned before. I, I also agree that we need to have a right uh, communication and spectrum management uh, infrastructure. and. Um, Again, we, we have to prove out also that we can properly interoperate uh, operate between all the systems where we are uh, working on already. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Bevert, the big three. Uh, I, I would concur with, uh, with Dr. Previtt, uh, and uh, that 
we it on UTM it's uh, we we need to continue the funding for uh, the work that the FAA and NASA are doing, um, and uh, additionally, uh, the you know for us to roll out this service that's not predicated on um, on UTM, we will be operating within the existing um, Part 135 framework, but we do very much look forward to um, those tools becoming available so that we can scale to uh, much much denser operations. Yeah. So um, just finally, I have been paying attention this whole time. You probably see me texting. I'm texting my uh, sophomore engineering student son in college and telling him about what this hearing's about. And uh, he had a very interesting question that I wanted to pass on because I think it's absolutely relevant uh, about getting from point A to point B and how the drone uh, with people in it communicates to get from point A to point B. And I said, it's probably satellite communications. So he goes, I don't like it. If it's communicating through a satellite, why not just hack the flight? So the question really is a kind of a fundamental one about not just the safety, will it follow the sky or is it safe to fly in, but the security, the secured communication to ensure that the, even a piloted uh, drone or a pilotless drone uh, has to get from point A to point B. And what, how are you thinking about the security of that communication of that flight so that flight gets from point A to point B? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's incredibly important and um, in, including the, it, it needs to be redundant and diverse uh, communication. So you have cellular, uh, connections, you could potentially have multiple carriers, cellular connections from multiple carriers, and um, and satellite communications. So uh, that diversity um, and each of those links is secured uh, such that uh, the ability to have all of those uh, communications simultaneously compromised is very, very low. Yeah. Ms. Scott, have you, do you have some thoughts on this as a carrier? Or? Certainly. Uh, Designing for security and reliability should be a top concern for any UTM uh, system development and for the technical standards that support those systems. Uh, we are excited about the potential of LTE networks um, to provide that secure uh, communications link and have been doing a lot of R&D work on that in the context of UTM development and uh, look forward to collaborating closely with the FAA and other regulators to understand the performance-based criteria that we need to meet, uh, and then being able to design for that security and resiliency. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just make one note. Uh, next year, about the time you're <coughs> rolling out the pilot on uh, maybe the simulators or so on, maybe it'd be a good time for the uh, subcommittee to get back up to the tech center um, in the later winter, early spring. Great, that would be wonderful. And uh, thank you again for uh, coming out and seeing us about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, the employees at the Technical Center really appreciated your attention and taking time to see the great work we do. So thank Whatever you. Whatever Frank wants, Frank gets. <laughs> Next year, too. <laughs> you have to talk to your spouse about that. All right. Um, <laughs> and your dog. <laughs> okay, uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions they may have may have been submitted to them in writing and unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. So I want to thank our entire panel. I think this was uh, very interesting and informative. I thank you for your uh, commitment and expertise to this particular issue. Um, but Shelley, if you would pass on a particular thanks to the thousands of men and women at the Tech Center uh, who are doing such incredible work each and every day uh, to keep our air system the best and the safest in the entire nation. And with that, we stand adjourned.